This podcast may contain adult themes. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The views and opinions in this podcast are expressly our own. When I get into the workplace, I like to fuck shit up. Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. Hey, are you tired of toxic workplaces and the negativity that comes with them? We hear you and we're here to shake things up. Welcome to Let's Break Up Toxic Workplace Stories, the podcast that's all about breaking up with workplace toxicity. I'm Nicola, and I'm here with my co-host Gina. Together, we're going to explore real-life experiences of workplace toxicity and offer a sense of encouragement and unity. That's right. We're tackling the tough topic of negativity in the workplace and turning it into a movement for positivity. We'll be interviewing guests to share their experiences and offer practical solutions for dealing with workplace toxicity. Our aim is to promote solidarity and a sense of community amongst our listeners. Let's Break Up is quickly becoming the go-to source for anyone looking to share and then ditch the drama and create a happier, healthier work environment. So join us each week as we explore the various forms of toxicity in the workplace. Get ready to join the revolution against red flags and toxic workplaces. Thanks for tuning in and don't forget to like, subscribe, and tell all your friends. In this week's episode, as our pregame chat. Yes. I wonder, I'm curious to know, curious minds must know, I'm curious to know if other podcasters work as hard as we do. I, I'm sure they do, but here's my thought about it. It's okay. like the ones that are like the big podcasts, like oh, no, they, they obviously, well, right. They have like an army of people who are doing the writing and the researching and all that. I mean, I don't think this type of podcast could ever be like written no, because, you know, it, it's very much like we're just sharing, you know, we're commiserating. I could have I could have easily done with another hour of sleep this morning easily. Uh, Same, because what I keep kind of doing is I do this like really fun thing where I wake up around like that witching hour of like 334. Oh, my God, that's the worst. Lately, it's been to pee. But for for while we were while I was working at the place we met, I would, I would be like mentally just abused and done by like seven 30. I'd get into bed at seven 30 and then I'd wake up at like midnight or one and I wouldn't be able to fall asleep for like was two Was it hours. like crippling anxiety at that time? Just, I don't know if it was anxiety. It was just, I couldn't shut my brain off. You know, I, I would wake up at like 3 AM with crippling anxiety thinking that something has gone horribly wrong. Which was most likely the True. truth. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like for you, it was definitely the truth. Um, I just remember the first day that I worked there, like that I was kind of released into the wild. Like my WhatsApp wouldn't stop going off like f- from 10 p.m. on. And I quickly had to like be like, all right, that's not what we're doing. Like that's not how I work. That's not how anyone should work. Well, I'm curious to maybe talk to our guest today about some mm-hmm. of these feelings that we had because we're talking to a doctor Ooh, fancy. very fancy yeah oh so fancy and she has a phd in psychology right and she's gonna be talking a about, little like, bit fancy for us very fa- cool. very fancy i um, almost feel like we need like mimosas and canapes i think i think this one's gonna be interesting because i'm curious to kind of maybe use our workplace as an example of well so she also is going to be talking about like frenemies and how women often try to cut down other women and yeah I mean the majority of people at our workplace were women and I absolutely felt that oh good morning (laughs) how are you we're good good I I say good but I'm like it's the butt crack of tomorrow morning I'm like (laughs) I hope you're ca- using caffeine there. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Where oh, yes. are you coming to us from, Amber? I'm in, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Okay. Where's Virginia? Yeah. Where is no, that? Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, but it where is, is Virginia? It's um, underneath. Yeah, East Coast. Coast. Yeah. So, but like yeah. close to where you are. No, but it's on the East Coast. Oh, no, wait, that's 
Yeah, no, that's on the East Coast. Yeah, but when I was still in Manhattan, I would be closer to her than where I am now because I'm all yeah. the way down in South wait, Florida. I'm, wait, I've got to Google where this is. Oh, or where are you in Florida? I'm, I'm like, right out. I'm right outside of Miami. Got it. I'm kind of in between the middle of New York and Florida. Yeah, you. Kind oh, of wait, I see now. I just heard this weird statistic. How how close are you to Norfolk, Virginia? No, so Norfolk which is what they oh, pronounce yeah. it. Yeah, they Norfolk. pronounce it with Norfolk. Um, yeah, what's the so statistic? You're not that close because the statistic is like, it's the one air- city that has like the most murder per capita. Wait, what? So tell us who you are, why you thought it would be cool to come here and chat with us today. So I saw you all in the Facebook group from the podcast collab. And I have to say your toxic workplace stories got me because that's, I specialize in mean girls. So I'm all about female rivalry and I've studied it. I wrote a book about it and um, it happens between women in general, but Mm -hmm. um, it's especially awful when it happens at work, when, you know, that's your livelihood for your making money. And I've, so I have some horrible, horrible stories. That's what I wrote my dissertation on about this happening at work. And Mm -hmm. now that's what I do. So um, I just thought, wow. And then I listened to, and I'm like, oh, I like these two. So um, <laughs> um, I just thought that was a good synergy. So um, that's me in a nutshell. Yes. Okay. Well, but you're fancier than that. <laughs> I may have prepared a little introduction. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> oh, no, wait, time out. No, what yeah. Nicola has now come like become very fond of is putting in people's like how to introduce so-and-so in yeah. um, chat. chat CPG. Yeah. That, yeah. And then it comes out with like, it the makes most. you sound like you're way better that, well, in my case, it made <laughs> me sound way better than I probably am. Yeah. You've done a good job for Amber, I would like to state. Okay. Let's hear okay. it. Okay. If, Amber, you could either support chat GPG, the AI, okay. or you could yeah. refute. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Nicola. Pleasure to introduce Dr. Amber, a highly accomplished individual with a PhD in IO psychology and the founder of 2B Coaching and Consulting. You are, from what I have seen, a respected thought leader in the area of women's rivalry, offering valuable insights and strategies to help women navigate this very complex topic. With her extensive knowledge and experience, she has become a sought after consultant and coach for individuals and organizations seeking to address issues related to workplace dynamics, toxicity, leadership, and diversity and inclusion. We are thrilled to have Dr. Amber here with us today to share her expertise with us. It's kind of on. It sounds very fancy when you say it, but um, that's I talk right. about mean girls at work. Yeah. <laughs> I right. feel like we're going to have to n- use a lot of mean girl memes in this entire episode. Absolutely. So it's the specifically perfect- fetch. We're getting rid of that. <laughs> well, no. So I've been trying to get Nicola on board with calling our listeners Toxies, like, hey, yeah. Toxie, he- hey, fellow Toxie. Toxie. I feel like it's the perfect time since you're like, you're specialized in mean girls that we but should like start, that. right? I- See, so I have approval from Dr. <laughs> Amber. So go F yourself, Nicola. Well, you know why it makes it, it makes it fun, but it stand it like catches your attention. Right. So, yeah. hey, Toxies, so we're going to sh- it's so fetch that we're saying, hey, Toxies. So I want um, Dr. Amber to get into it. Yeah, let's get into it. So I'm, I'm curious Perfect. to know, you, you mentioned that you've, you've listened to a couple of uh, the episodes of the podcast and you know that we met at a toxic workplace yes. that was run by women. So I'm kind of curious to know, and not like a hugely deep diving into it, but what were some of the things that you kind of identified as red flags when listening to it first and foremost that this is so um common and it's just not talked about but often Mm -hmm. so um I don't know I can't remember how long ago I mean when you first recognized you both were experiencing it how long it took you to actually talk about it because that usually is slow to come to the surface it was slow Yeah, because you kind of feel, I know, so I wrote all about this. I have all my um, schoolwork on it. And then later it happened to me and I didn't even realize it was happening to me after I studied this. So it's a phenomena, right? Yes. It's like, what, like, it's like, you might not remember, but one of the first things out of the owner's mouth when we had our very first interview was 
well, nobody's quit, but we have fired people. And I just thought like, ha that's cute. Like what a fucking yeah. red flag. That's a big red flag. I don't but, need to know that. But it can be like, it's not talked about. And then when it does start to bubble up, I'm sure most people do find out it's happening to other women. But when it is to you, you feel alienated. Often it's not done in front of other people. It it squishes your self-esteem mm -hmm. and it's hard. To, it's very intangible. So it's hard to document and share it with other people to relay what's happening, especially like if you escalated it, you know, like it's kind of ambiguous, but it makes you feel off. I think yeah. one of our things, you know, I think that we both agree with is our big issue was around that toxic positivity piece. There was yeah. a ton of toxic positivity and we're pretty direct people. So we're like, let's just go and sort out whatever we need to sort out. This is, yeah. we do not need the fluff and the pandering no. around that, mm -hmm. but we were reprimanded for not being as mm -hmm. fluffy as we should have been with these really toxically sweet syrupy dripping humans yeah and the number because you got fired for that Gina you got fired for not being toxically sweet I, I got fired because I quote unquote went against all their core values which were yeah. Dr. Seussisms <laughs> they, they none of them made sense um yeah contradicting I, very contradicting but I had 45 day like check in or whatever yeah. I was I was told like so you make people feel stupid and it's like well when I when I yeah. actually know something because I've experienced it and I'm saying no what you're suggesting won't work you know if you have a question as to why it won't work I'll be happy to explain but I have yeah. a million other things going on that you guys are piling on top of me that I don't feel like I need to go into the nitty-gritty of why it won't work if I know for a fact it won't work well, and that's your experience. That's why they hired you in my right. thoughts. Yeah. And I had it in a different way. I got told I wasn't a team player. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, please, it's the same thing. Describe, please describe yeah. what exactly is a team player. Yeah. That I, she didn't actually say I didn't work well with others, but pretty much she said it in that nice way. Like you, you, you're not a team player, you know, and I'm like, but when you're giving other people the same work you're giving me because you don't trust me and then you're slowly taking me away from meetings and things like I'm not going to fall into that trap. I see what you're doing. And so like you, yeah, I'm I'm direct and I say things and it people don't like to hear the truth, but I don't mince words. Like I mean, this is me and this Neither. is what you get. <laughs> you know what I found though with that I bet that the people that were in charge were threatened by your knowledge. I, and, that's my yeah. thing. And I've you're comfortable other... in your, yes. And you're comfortable in your own skin. Like you yes. were not, you were not bothered. You didn't acquiesce to the group norm. And you're like, this is how it is because I know it. Like you were comfortable in your knowledge. And when somebody isn't, they're threatened by it. And that's often another way these ugly behaviors come to the surface. So, so okay. So when I you were. I'm curious to know now when yeah. you were let go for not being a team player, what, what were some of the other red flags that had come up that you, cause you said you didn't even notice it. So they didn't let me go. I quit. So it went on for like six months and mind you, I was a consultant at the, <laughs> and I had That's taken the same over thing the, as what yeah. happened with me. Yeah. I, I had taken I over the team. Yeah. 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 Um, I'd taken over the team while the one individual was out. And when she came back, I don't know what it was that set her off, but it slowly just, I began to be uninvited to meetings. She began not sharing information with me. Um, she um, took credit for my work. Um, there were all these different things. And I just, you know, that feeling like you can feel it. So I approached her on a couple of times and I, I thought I'll put it back on me. You know, we're here for the same problem. Like I feel our communication could be better. Oh no, Amber, the communication is just fine. But then the next two days later, she like exploded on me. And I think in looking back, it's because I took initiative and it caught her off guard. But when she could take initiative and be in control, then she could say what she wanted. So and all honestly, how I really knew I needed a change and had to leave is my mom said, I hate to see you doubt yourself because of this woman. And I went, oh my God, like I am, this is what I've studied. And if I 
have studied this extensively and I don't see it. What's it do to women who have no clue? Like it sucked me under. I was just thinking I needed to change projects, but no, she was mm-hmm. awful. I like to ask the question because I'm a firm believer that we all had a part, we all have a part to play in yeah. the workplace, even if it is toxic, even yeah. if it is toxic. And I, you know, I, I identify some of my issues. What yep. part do you think you can take responsibility for in that dynamic? I agree with you because I think to a degree, we all do have, whether we know it or not, it might be right. our subconscious, but we all mm-hmm. play, play a part. I will shut down sometimes if I am called out immediately because I need to process it, you know? Okay. And so I think with that, with her, I think our personality styles were very different with working together. Um and uh, I probably didn't handle it from the onset of, you know, learning what her style was, what her triggers were, and then vice versa, me knowing my style, what my triggers are. So just that kind of more psychological safety awareness of how mm-hmm. you work with people or what your brain does. And um, so I totally own that. And I totally own that some, there were parts of, I mean, I had done this in other parts of this company and I did it seamlessly. So, you know, I, I knew the work and how to do it in my sleep. I'm not saying I'm all this and that, but I, yeah, I would say it would probably be our personality styles, like learning to, you know, you're not always going to ha- work with people that you love. You just have no. to deal with that. But, and so after a while, I just got to the point where I think, and the, the behavior towards me, like you kind of shut down. And so then it got to the point that fuck you. I don't want to, I'm done. So I shut down and I wasn't really doing as much. So yeah, I did start to lose interest in doing the work. I I very much identify with that. Cause I was just like, I I'm not, I'm like, I'm clearly not valued. Yeah. And studies show that when you aren't valued or appreciated, your productivity goes down, your desire to collaborate and work with others, because you don't know how you're going to be received. It's natural, but it's just, I also think hindsight is 2020 when if you would have asked me what was going on in the moment, I would have said nothing. She's crazy. You know? (laughs) Yeah. But there's probably, there was probably truth to To that that common reaction. Yeah. Like she's nuts or she's crazy. Like, yeah, I, you know, I can only speak for myself, but looking back at, you know, the workplace that we started the podcast about, Mm -hmm. you know, the actual premise of the company, if I really stopped to think about it. Yeah. This we don't like anymore. (laughs) Yeah. Was um, to profit off of an already vulnerable demographic. After I stepped away from it, I just felt really gross that I was part of that. No, that like, makes complete sense. And yeah, but sometimes I think it's hard to, it's hard to assess a culture until you're actually in it. Because if, when you're interviewing and everybody's on their best behavior and you're doing your research, who's going to tell you the nitty gritty about Oh, I did. I gave her the red flags. I would, I would but That's it's the like thing. a lot of people, people don't. But people did in my, when I came on, I just was like, they're a small company. They're a small startup. Yeah. This isn't anything I can't handle. They probably just don't have the experience. And that's why someone like me will be beneficial. And if I had been given the ability to work in the way that I work best and shine, I could have absolutely helped that company grow and turn it around. Yeah. Um, but I was constantly told, you know, you're not nice enough or butting heads with people and, not nice enough. you know, <laughs> and, and it was all women there. It's funny enough. Yeah. The one man who is employed there currently, he was my biggest fan. He's like, you make my job so much easier. Of course he like, did. He's not threatened by you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. wait, so can you explain like, or how this so, happens how does this happen how, why does this happen is it because women are threatened by other women like what is, is it because it? women are dicks what is happening here? <laughs> <laughs> they don't have one so they make up for it no yeah. um what um <laughs> there are so many reasons why and so it's this i'll just say i did not study men i don't want to exclude men but i've only studied women so yeah. that's just what put that, that out caveat. There. Um, that's so cool yeah think um, about what you know i'm here for exactly it. um 
Women, um, it can come from so many things. It can stem from jealousy. It can stem from the need for control. It can, you know, you're power hungry. It may be how you're raised. You grew up in an environment where you were never good enough, or you have a female figure in your life that was always putting you down. There are so many reasons why it comes. But with women, women, we constantly, whether we know it or not, are comparing ourselves with our friends, with our sisters, with our mothers. And so there is that comparison that all women have. That's how it comes out. And also when women or girls, little girls, they, little boys and little girls are born with the same type of aggression. So when I did my research, I had to go to theories of aggression because, you know, there's nothing out there about mean girls. But with um, little girls develop social intelligence earlier than little boys. And that's when the brain starts forming. And that's when it it goes from a physical type of aggression to that mental or using your brain type of aggression. So that's why it's developed earlier in girls. And it is more prominent in girls. And it doesn't mean men or boys don't have it. But girls will use get back with words or, you know, intangible or passive aggressive aggressions where men think about you might have Tom and Dave in the boardroom and they're mad at each other and they're pissed off. And then an hour later, they'll be on the golf course having a beer and having a good old time and they've left it all behind. Women kind of sit to uh, tend to sit and think about things and it escalates with this type of behavior for women. It's it's not black and white. There are so many things that can, I mean, when you were talking, I was like, holy shit, this is a whole other, like 10 more years of therapy for me to have to go through. (laughs) Cause I was like, got it, had it, did it, done it, doing it now. Like exactly what you said. Me too. And I think maybe at one point in my career, well, certainly at the company that Nicola and I met at, I was considered the mean girl, but there I really was not, that was not my but you intention. were direct. It sounds like you were direct and that off put other people. Yes. And that's why yes. you were like, mean girl. So I was the mean girl first, but then <laughs> right. I had to and then... pass the mental. Oh, yes. So then you passed I got the it. torch. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so now so... you're two mean girls together who are actually not very not mean. mean. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it also yeah. goes to show that, like, not given the right environment, oh, people right? Like we won't yes. shine. We will become mean girls. considered mean people. We will become yeah. manipulative. Um, so a lot of the work I do, I'm really focusing on it now and I I'm getting accredited in it right now. So I guess I did, I am going back to school too, but in psychological safety, because, um, It's always been a part of what I do, but now this will like, this just helps me explain it better to people. Mm -hmm. So when I say, um, I I like in female rivalry or mean girl at work behaviors as bullying. And so that is a result of a lack of a psychologically safe work environment, which Gina is exactly what you are saying. If you have an environment where you can speak openly, there's no fear to raise your hand or be direct where you're yourself 100%, that is psychological. You feel safe to work there. And as a result, you give more and the productivity levels go up because your brain, your body, you're happy there. But when you don't have that, For example, in an unpsychological safe environment where mean girls behaviors are occurring, often the bad behavior is getting rewarded. And so that makes everybody step back and think, what the hell is going on here? This isn't right. But people are afraid to speak up and talk about it because then you'll be in trouble for it. And I, and I think out of everyone at that company, Nicola and I were the only two to ever question or speak up about certain things that we found like that were per- inappropriate perhaps not, yeah not not just inappropriate but could have been done better um yeah. you know why are we using this vendor in my instance yeah. can why we are we bleeding money right yeah um and then Good yes for you we, though but but it wasn't a psychologically safe environment yeah. It was it was caveated as a psychologically safe yes. environment with, you know, oh, let's do our grateful 
Wednesdays or whatever, you know, yeah. everybody share something you're grateful about and like all of these and things. I, I Be vulnerable, it's... take mental health days. You've got unlimited mental health days. It's like, no, we don't have time to take yeah. mental health days. Yeah. And also what I found, like uh, I would post something like, yeah. I'm thankful for my partner and being able to go back to New York for the weekend and like post a picture of me and my partner in New York and like nobody yeah. said anything about anything. Not that I need validation, but yeah. then like, the super See, sugary sweet COO would be like, we got, I'm getting I got my, my toenails a, done. Yeah. Or like, I got my kids a goldfish and here's a picture of me holding the goldfish and everyone's <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God, that's so cool. What'd you oh, name it? Such and, a good I, parent. and I'm just yeah. like, I'm like, okay, so clearly I am chopped liver. And then, so then one, then the next, or they were trained to kiss her booty because that's, that's what it was. Yeah. But then I did like my own, like unofficial experiment. I was like, all right, let me talk about my daughter and my dogs the next week. Still nothing. No, I was like, this is fucking bullshit. I stopped participating. I was like, I don't don't have time for this. And this is all bullshit. Like it's to, it's trained. for her to get likes and they've she's trained them to get likes and and can we just pause here for a second and remind people that if this podcast is something you enjoy we would love to hear from you you can find us on instagram linkedin and youtube at let's break up toxic workplace stories sharing and subscribing really helps us feel validated oh god yeah, yeah. all right yeah so so i'm i'm kind of curious to dig more into kind of the study that you've done because yeah. it sounds bloody fascinating it's hugely fascinating so i was at a very well known company and i my, my background um io psychology is psychology of the workplace so i had to do something about a problem i saw at work And um, I thought, okay, I wanted it to be about women. I didn't know what it was at the time, but then um, I saw it happening and I call it the elephant in the boardroom because it was the two women at hand, but people would tiptoe around it and you could feel it. Like you maybe couldn't place your name on what, you know, the word on what was occurring, but you could totally feel it and good women were walking. And so that's what piqued my interest. So when I officially for my schoolwork, I interviewed nine women just in the, at, in the workplace and their experiences. And I was wrecked after hearing their stories. I'm like, this is really real. It's not just a cat fight. It's not just women being dramatic. It's an ugly, awful behavior that when women say they won't work for somebody again, or won't be on a team of all women, or they don't have female friends, I'm like, that's tragic. We're half of the population. And I can't imagine what it feels like to not have my female friends by my side. And so I got my dissertation and then I kept collecting stories. I have tons of stories. So it was then it was like in families then it's in social circles. It's in the neighborhood, it's at work. And then I like, oh my God, this is happening everywhere. So that's what kept me going because I felt like the women felt like they had a trusted space to share their story, but they also felt like they were being heard. And the one thing I've heard from anyone I've ever gotten a story from is that they felt alone and that they had no one at their back. And I'm like, that's awful. So Mm -hmm. it's sad. Yeah, it's so sad. And to not know that there are women that can uplift and empower you, it's tragic. It's just... But, you know, social media and pop culture makes fun of the behavior and it's not, it's not funny. Going back to your study, you said that you felt like totally wrecked after hearing some of these women's stories. Yeah. Are you um, willing to share maybe one or two of the ones that really stood out? Yeah. Or you remember the best? Yeah, I have. So I, I put... I, in my book, I, I ha- I've I shared a lot of them because I think that helps to hone in. One gal, let me see if I get it right. One gal, this was one in particular. She was working at a job she really enjoyed. And she had met this other gal. Um, they weren't forever friends, but they. it was one of those people that she met and they got along fabulously and they just became good friends. And she said so much so that we spent holidays with each other. Like, she brought her to her family. So that, to, in my mind, when you're bringing somebody to a holiday, a family holiday, that's a a good friendship. You're not just bringing anybody yeah. to your family holiday gathering. So this other individual um, 
was looking for a job and she was very, um, she's like, it seems like you work in this great place. Are there any openings? Well, there was an opening and um, I can't think of their names. I'll say Mary introduced Jane to this new job and Jane had an interview and got hired and they ended up being on the same team. Well, um, and Mary was excited for, her. in fact, Mary actually led that team and Jane was on her team, but it was, you know, like a big collaborative group. Well, Jane started to not talk to Mary. She started to ignore her. She started to act like they, and she became unbearable in the workplace, like really targeted Jane and was ugly with her behavior towards her. And other people began to notice it. What? So the HR director got involved. Jane, Mary took it up with the HR leader and said, can't you see what's going on? Like, can't you do something about it? This is disruptive. And we used to be friends. And the HR leader said, well, Mary, I think you're imagining it. I don't think you two are as good as friends as you thought you were. And I think you're making it all up. And so fast forward, it turns out the HR director and Jane became, became good friends. And I knew it. Yes. And she it. was, it was crazy. Like, and there are way more details and different things, but Mary ended up leaving that work environment. And she, she said, I was so baffled and hurt. I never understood it. Like um, Jane wouldn't talk to her or tell her why she got so crazy. I don't know if it was because Mary was her leader and they were friends yeah. and then she had to report to her. That might be my first guess, but it's they they were certainly no longer friends and the fact that she lost a friendship somebody that was a good enough friend to take home to the holiday the family the holiday, yeah and then um then she left her job and that this hr person didn't believe her she found out that her and the hr gal were good friends like going out to bars hanging out on the weekends like it became a really good it was just it was toxic and so she was um really hurt, you know, on many levels by that. That was, that's one that just comes to mind. And some of the examples she shared, I was like, oh my God, like you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so don't you think like my take on that would yeah. be that uh, Jane and HR lady, Jane probably had the HR lady's like ear and was talking yep. shit about Mary, Absolutely. Absolutely. which is gossipy is a mark of yeah. a toxic workplace. Right. Yeah. So, well, and but, shame on the HR person for, you know, if you're engaging in that, you shouldn't be engaging in that. Yeah, right. Oh, hold on. Fun fact about gossip in the workplace. Mm. Mm -hmm. I saw a statistic on LinkedIn. Granted, not the best source of information, but <laughs> you know what? I'll take, I'll take what I get every so often. And okay, let's hear they, it. Did, they did a survey of millennials who said, and I think it was like 47%. It could have been 44, 47%. Um, said that they actually enjoy workplace gossip because it makes you feel closer to your colleague. Oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, that's why people gossip. It, it's, it, it fosters a sense of bonding and trust. Community. Foster, it, yes, it's, yeah. it doesn't mean it's real, but it, it initially feels like it. Yeah. But, so, but don't you think, I kind of like, I, there's part of me that thinks workplace gossip is important in some aspects, I guess, depending on what type of gossip, is it character assassination? That's not good. But yeah. is it like gossiping about like something frivolous? Like I think so-and-so whatever, like, dick. or not, I, I don't know. I feel like that might be character assass assassination or just like, I don't know. I feel like there are, there is a level of quote unquote office gossip, like talk around the water cooler in yeah. the olden days that does foster a sense of community. Like, you know, I remember years ago, you know, coming into the office and everybody talking about the episode of The Office they saw last night. Like, that's a form of gossip, right? But it was like- Or is that sharing? All... I, feel like right. to... I don't know, because yeah. then like, then like someone would say, well, our boss is like Michael. And we'd be like, ha well, ha ha, you know? Like, yeah. that's funny, yeah. but- but it wouldn't go past that. And I yeah. think that it did kind of foster some sort of office or de departmental camaraderie, you know? Well, I think sharing, some, you have to share, like sharing, you watch the office and then sharing personal tidbits. That's how you get to know each other as people and not just workplace 
I always right. get nervous you know? with sharing, right? Because yeah. I'm I'm naturally an open book. If you ask me a question, I will absolutely give yeah. you the honest answer. I'm not going to sugarcoat the answer for you. If you say, "Oh, tell me tell me about your childhood trauma." I'm like, "Let me let me unpack this for you. <laughs> Strap on in, sister. Yeah. Let yeah. me go." And I'm like, <laughs> "Do I know that it I know being vulnerable and being approachable and being connected to people is really important in the workplace, but I wonder if sometimes for me particularly but I don't know about others um if it's sharing too much and then you're just a target for gossip well I think you have to know who you're sharing with are they a valuable trusted person like if you're sharing top secrets is it to be trusted in their vault of secrecy or are they going to be are they the office gossip that goes out and shares with everybody and then adds a little bit more, you know, like, cause that's what happens with gossip. A little bit extra always is added. Um, I'm curious. Yeah, it's kind of like a game of like telephone almost. It's, yeah. And it's like, yeah. you hear, you know, by the time it gets to the, the final person or whatever, it's completely off the mark. Um, yes. So back to your story, like my, when you first started telling us about it, I was like, nope, do not hire friends. Like that exactly. is, yep. so I made the mistake of getting my friend hired as an intern at a company that I was at many, many years ago, like probably close mm -hmm. to 15 years ago. And we got into a personal fight about something Yeah, and she took it upon herself to email the owner of the company and say all of these awful things about me, which at the time, none of them were true. I'm surprised yeah. I kept my job. Um, yeah. I was just like, I can't, like, you're fucking with my livelihood. Like, I would never. No. How did the owner or, handle it, though? Did they believe Well, her? she was a fucking toxic mess yeah. herself. So she, okay. but so she like, were like her desk was like within my peripheral view and she sent me an email about it and said, would you like to explain yourself? So what I did was I walked <laughs> up to her like the 10 feet away. And I was like, everything that that woman, like everything that this girl said was patently untrue, you know, because in, in the email, she alleges that I wanted to start my own company. And I have, I did eventually go on to start my own company, but at the, at that time, that wasn't something I was thinking of. Sure. What had happened is we had gone to the beach and she was like, if you had your own company, what do you think you would do? And I was like, oh my God, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like, ba, ba, ba. like maybe I'd make this item. Maybe I'd make that item because I'm in product development. And so she used that against uh, me. I don't even know how I slept the night that that all unfolded. I did. I bet. I'm shocked. But I don't know and how. <laughs> I take it you were not friends with her anymore. Oh, no. No, nope. that's and that's... eventually she did end up sending an email saying she shouldn't have done that and it wasn't true. But that was after a period of time where I felt I was being scrutinized and questioned. Yeah. You probably were. I mean I was. Yeah. Yeah. But it shows it's a vindictive, reactive, you know. But I agree. I do not I it's like mix in family with money. You don't mix nope. friends and jobs. Like nope. there are certain things you just don't do because it never ends up well. <laughs> no, no. Which is why Nicola and I work well together because we were not friends. We were coworkers yes. and we worked yes. with each other. Yeah. Now we, uh, now I do consider Nicola a friend. That's the but only sequence in which yeah. it works. Like exactly. you can't be friends. And if no. that does, if that situation does exist, it is very unique, very, yeah, like so very too. unique. It would be yeah. like a one, yeah. a one time thing. Okay. No. So tell us, tell us another um, story that stuck with you. When this happens too, it can happen at any age. It starts at such a young age. So you think, I know a lot of people think, oh, middle school, high school. I remember with my daughter, I was shocked. It started in kindergarten and I, she came home and told me about how these girls were playing on the playground. And I thought, first I thought, oh God, I thought I had more time. And then the second thing I thought was this is these little girls are mirroring behaviors that they see from other females in their life. Because at five years old, you just don't have it in you to act like this. Like you're no, seeing I'm it from somewhere. So well, how are they acting? Were they like being aggressive or being aggressive and mean on the playground? Well, you can't do that. Or you stay, you know, just 
mean, just not nice. That so it, we're, you know, as devil's advocate, we're, yeah. you know, as, as a parent myself, um, yes. I'm curious to know, was that, um, cause they're five and they're not exactly. quite cognizant yet. Is yeah. that a direct translation potentially of assertiveness that they haven't quite landed the delivery of it assertion? Could be. And it could be, and it could be that they've seen it, another prominent figure in their life being assertive, but they don't also yet have the social skills to, to deliver it, it well. Exactly. So, or, or to like differentiate between being assertive and aggressive. Yeah. Yes. Or assertive yes. and mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also like in terms of to flip it to back to the mean girl behaviors, I'm like, mm-hmm. I, you don't want to raise somebody that will be walked over. I want to raise a strong oh, girl and boy, you know, both of my kids, yes. I want them to have their voice and use it, but I want them to have empathy and be kind. And so what I always say is it hurts if somebody is not being nice to you, but how you respond is totally up to you. You do not have to stoop to their level to get even. You can walk away or you can say something else or you can come back at it at a later time. But if you are responding with the same behavior that's directed towards you, then you're kind of doing the same thing they are. You're part of the problem. Of, you're like, part of the let's problem. Let's try to be part of the, yeah. the solution instead. So what happens though, like obviously you know, we know that you said it starts a lot earlier than we would even think this whole like mean girl thing, but why do you think it might come out in workplace? Like, I don't, I'm having trouble actually asking the question, but why Why more at work than other places? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. I think that's, I think that's the question. Yeah. So socially it will come out, but I think with work, you know, like work is your livelihood. It's where you make your money. It's, um, a lot of times Mm -hmm. it's your identity, you know, depending Mm -hmm. on what you're doing. And so, um, maybe you're, if you're in an environment where there are few women, there's less room at the top. If you're in an environment where there's, you know, limited seats at the table, or the glass ceiling, you know, there are so many mm-hmm. things. Um, maybe somebody's just mean and wants to take you out and doesn't like you, you know, like you it could be that, that base, like it could just- be that, but at work, it's it's hard to often I speak my voice, but some people don't like if if you feel if there's fear, like if the person that's projecting the behavior toward you is in charge of your paycheck or your promotional track, that's scary. Because it can be a full-time job to look for a job. And so it's not so easy to just leave or quit like I did. It For everybody listening, always have your resume up to date. Like that's mm-hmm. like one of yes. my key things. <laughs> so you can like jump ship if you need to, because, but yeah, I think there are so many factors at work. A lot of it is jealousy. It sounds like Gina, you dealt with the jealousy. Maybe you too, Nicola, like, but I know with me, I th- I truly think the gal was jealous when I had it really bad because I came from the background that we were working in for the project we were on. And she came from a totally different background. So when we were talking about changing the culture and, you know, changing leadership and in- implementing these organizational development strategies. This was new to her. So I had, I had the learning curve on her, but in my mind, I'm like, we're working together as a team, but she didn't see it that way. It was like, she probably saw you were like a know-it-all or something to her. Probably. It probably felt yeah. like, or also, um, what is that thing that the kids say? Imposter syndrome. Yes. Is, yeah. Like, so it's, it's a big like, deal too. Self-doubt. I don't, I always, I don't, I'll be I honest, always feel imposter syndrome. I don't really <laughs> quite understand what it means. Like to me, I just, I think it means for me that I don't actually think I'm as successful as I am because or you I doubt might, your successes. Like you, I doubt, you, yeah. I doubt. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so what I always say, like, I, I think that is a huge deal. I think low self-esteem, but what I say to people, like, in a way I call the imposter syndrome, that voice in the back of your shoulder, Mm -hmm. that talker, I call it your inner she bully. She's there chatting away and you have to shut her up because if you don't like what that little voice is saying to you, you're not going to like yourself. And I'm a firm believer that women who like themselves love other women. Like that's what it comes down to. If you don't like yourself, it's going to be very hard to form relationships with other people. I don't think that's true because I dislike myself so intensely 
that I want to like other people more. But why? Uh, you shouldn't just like yourself. Come on. What's going on there? <laughs> I think it's just I had a narcissistic hard. parent. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like it's very hard as a woman to actually like yourself, period. Well, regardless of your upbringing, regardless yeah. of what kind of parents or family dynamic you had. I think it is extremely difficult because of all of the extraneous pressures that are on us. There are um, a ton. Yeah. I think I don't necessarily think it's doable all the time, but I think you can make an effort to do it a lot. No, of you, you yeah. have to, yeah. you, you have, have to, to make a concerted effort, whether that's um, therapy or journaling or whatever works for you. Yes. But I don't think, I think it's very rare to have a woman who likes doesn't themselves. Have self, yeah. Or doesn't have oh, self-doubt. Yeah. Oh no, just, I am totally, that's when you have to tame the she bully, but yeah, um, she's, yeah, I think you, she's you there. Have, you have to just basically work on it. It's like be a mindful work in progress. of progress. Yeah. Always. Yes. Even now, even after I have done a shit ton of work on myself in all the ways, I still doubt myself. I still doubt my successes. I still doubt the way I look. I did get a boob job. I hate my boob job. Like everything, it's still there. And I don't know if it's worse for our generation. Hopefully it gets better, like for my daughter's generation. I don't know. No, it's hard. But if you look at what's out there and what's presented to us, like there's always a way to make yourself better. Yeah, I guess. So, so let's circle all the way back. <laughs> we could talk for so, hours. This is we separated could, but- as well. Gina, Gina gets me, go, she gets me raved up about circling raved back. Up. Raved okay, but up. so, so. What are the coping mechanisms I was gonna ask when, same. yeah, for if you do find you have a workplace girl bully slash friend, frenemy, like what should you, how should you handle it? What Person, is in yeah. your control? What's the, what's the anecdote, the uh, anecdote, the antidote, the, antidote. <laughs> the anecdotal yeah, evidence, um, the antidote, <laughs> just the stop anti-toxin. talking, Nicola, the stop antitoxin. Talking. <laughs> You always, so because this is so passive aggressive and um, intangible, it's hard to tell if you want somebody to help you, if you want to go to HR, go to a leader. So document, 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 always Mm -hmm. document. It doesn't mean record somebody because you can get into trouble for that. But um, Nicola got fired. Yes. I've heard of women getting fired, but it worked in their favor to highlight what this mean person was doing, but you have to know like what state or where you have you, to know what the, the laws, laws are. The state. The laws. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's tricky when you're in New Zealand and you are allowed to record people. Well then have at it. Because but it's that's tricky. the best way to find. Yes. So um, document because after a while, a theme will be produced and then you have evidence to share with somebody. Um, if you feel comfortable going to talk to this individual one-on-one, but maybe go for a coffee or go for a walk. So you're not in the work environment, put it, I put it back on me. I feel like we could work better together. She denied it. She completely said there was no problem. So that could backfire. Maybe to her that there wasn't, who knows? Like two days later, she exploded on me, but I, (laughs) okay. Okay. Yeah. No, but I I think think there might be some cases where they truly don't see it. They can't see their behavior. Absolutely. Um, so try talking to that person. Um, if, um, you don't feel comfortable with them, maybe bring somebody in when you're alone. So it chances are, if you do that, it won't happen because a lot of times the di- behavior dissipates if other people are around and then escalate it if you can. But I think sometimes you really have to look hard and ask some hard questions. Is this the work environment I want to be in? Because even if it changes, is this behavior accepted? It kind of sounds like with the example you two gave, those behaviors were the norm. And so yes. if th- if that's the case, do I have, do I need to walk away because, you know, your job is your livelihood and you look at how much time you spend there. And when you're dealing with these behaviors, they don't just stay at work. They come home with you. They impact every part Absolutely. of your life. And especially they can be now that we are often 
working yes. from yes. home, it's exactly. even harder. I, I know we've kind of touched on kind of the antidotes or the antitoxins for yeah. these toxic workplaces. What are some of the other suggestions you would give to leaders or, you know, business owners or people that are leading groups of people or groups of women to avoid this from percolating and becoming a thing? Well, I think it's, again, back to the psychological safety, having an environment where people feel they can be themselves and open communication is key. And so I think when you onboard people and you know how you have your HR training, if you include this in the bullying behavior, um, but where there's awareness, I think so often things are not talked about and that what that's what makes it a taboo subject. Like you can't then openly address it. So you have to have transparent communication I also think, why not implement bystander training? You know, like if things are, everybody's aware, then it's a safe place to say, hey, I see this is going on. Um, bystander training, I love this. I'm yeah, a note for this yeah. bystander, it's a real thing. And so you would have training where everybody's on board, but then if somebody else sees it, they know they're not going to be a target if they raise their hand and say, hey, I don't like how you're treating so-and-so. Yeah. So that's a big one as well. And then- Often too, I don't know, I, sometimes this can backfire or not, but I think it's important to get to know each other as people and not just a coworker. Like, it doesn't mean you're best buddies with everybody, but if, you know, I now know you both have kids. And so like, if you get to know each other on a little bit more of a personal level, it puts an extra stake in the game and that helps. There's lots of little different things. And then there's the, you know, not three strikes you're out rule, one strike you're out. We don't tolerate this behavior here. Like if you do not treat people, you're not always going to be best friends with everybody. That's a given. Sometimes you're going to work with people you don't like, but if you could I tolerate- say it all the time. Exactly. If you can be kind and um, still get the work done and put your personal differences aside, like that's a big deal, but true mean people, I don't have any tolerance for them. I think then you're out of here. Yeah. And it's so funny because we were talking to someone else who was talking about how, you know, in a, in an ideal workplace, it's okay to have bad days. It's okay, you know, to say things, misspeak, and then go back and say, I'm so sorry. I said that I realized how inappropriate it, or whatever it is, but yeah. companies really don't want that. They, but they should, I mean, it's being vulnerable. To, yeah, they should. That's part of that psychological safety. Like yeah. you could, it's the vulnerability to say, Hey, I had a bad day. Hey, I made a mistake. It's mm -hmm. okay. It's not the end of the world, but so often in some environments, you make one little small error and it's hush hush. You can't talk about it because it's wrong and everybody will be on you for it. But again, if you are making a mistake or something happened, can't you also learn from that too? Like, I think there's yeah. learnings in those types of things. And who all the time is Mary Sunshine? No, I was going to say, tell us where we can find all of your stuff, Amber. Yes. Tell us where we can get all of your things from, because I'm actually really curious to go hunting for your book now. Oh, yeah, because well, I want to, I want to read all of, all of the juicy, the the juicy story. stories. The juicy stories. So my book is on Amazon. It's on print. It's on digital. And it's also on audible if you want to listen to it. So it's Ooh. my website is in the process of changing. It soon will be Dr. Amber Tishner, PhD, but right now it's www.2b.tobe coaching and consulting. So I'm, I'm just changing my name and, um, I'm on all the platforms, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, Facebook under the same name. Oh no, right. I'm transparent because you know what? It's all in here. Yeah. <laughs> I have changed names and I've changed, um, you know, I don't call out organizations by name. But right. Yeah. And we don't, everybody's we don't do anonymous. Exactly. Yeah, so, but I'm like, you know what, if you have something that needs to be shared, I think that can help other people like what you you two are doing this is awesome we're yeah we're we're excited about it and but i think it's so important just when the research i've done people don't talk about these things when they're in it and so if you have a more awareness of what's occurring it can help you talk about and give you support to know you're not crazy because i think so often people feel they're crazy when it happens to them especially at work i, I mean i definitely felt like am i am i the only one seeing this therefore yes. i must be crazy because nobody else is talking about this 
Yeah. You were there <laughs> longer and you had basically drunk the Kool-Aid and it was, it took you a little bit longer to really realize. Um, you know, our, I had seen a lot of red flags, as you know, um, but I just kept putting them. I just kept making excuses for them. And yeah, as we do, you know, yeah, as we do. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just really disappointed in myself, really, that as a, what I would assume is a smart woman. Um, no, don't be, don't be. I hear yeah. that so often. But I would, I, I would assume that I would have noticed. And then I'm like, That's how did I not yeah. see those? because it's different when it's targeted towards you like it's hard to see it when you're in it it's when you're out of it that you have more clarity but I swear every woman I've talked to they don't see it when they're in it they just know they're unhappy that they'll even start to get um, physical symptoms of it they'll get the Sunday blues like all these different things they get psychological things but it's hard to especially because it's that ambiguity and the intangibleness of the behavior. It makes you feel crazy. You begin to doubt yourself because why would somebody treat you that way if you haven't done anything to them? And you're not firing on all cylinders when you're experiencing you're not, that. So no, at I, all. I, and so it's it takes getting I out agree. of it to have a true reflection. Don't be hard on yourself, please. I, I felt like that for a hot minute because I was like, if I went back and looked at it, they and this is advice I have been giving to my friends and employees for years. People tell you who they are. You just have to be open enough to hear it and see it. Yeah. Well, so, the tigers don't change their stripes, like, right. Or zebras, so, whatever you want to use. It, yeah. yeah. So the company and the people were telling me exactly who they were in the interviewing process in my first week or so. I, for whatever reason, just wasn't listening to it or I was excusing it. I've come to the conclusion that I think it's, it was basically ego on my part. Cause I was like, well, they're a small startup. Nobody really knows what they're doing. I'm going to yeah. be able to swoop in here and play savior. And you can fix be the it. fix it. Yep. Yeah. And I think I probably could have been, but like you just mentioned, you know, the people around me saw me change within yeah. the first like month and a half. I ended up having a severe skin issue that I had to be on yeah. medication for months after yep. I left that company. So like I had everything, but because I, it's I've stress to, and your body has yeah. to deal with that in some We're like way. So so reacts- I'm very excited. I hope people buy your book because oh, it's, thank you. it seems very interesting. Um, and I will and- absolutely link it in the show notes. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. We'll link, yeah. We'll link you in the show notes. I love what you guys are doing. I think it's great. Thank you. Well, yeah. I hope you continue to listen and tune in. Absolutely. Um, and- You're fun to listen to. That's too. Some, some podcasts are bore snore, but you guys are fun. <laughs> <laughs> Cause like we talk about tits and dicks and as well as <laughs> we, we have also created our own like toxic podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. It was such a yeah. fun and informative conversation and keep in touch with us. And if you do come out with another book and you want to come back know. on, let us awesome. know. Thank you. Likewise, I'd love to keep in touch. Love you two ladies. And um, I'll chat with you later.